Hi, welcome to Kelsey Ed, and today we're going to be looking at the Paper 2 pre-release programming scenario for the IGCSE Computer Science. We're not going to look at a full solution to the programming, but we are going to look at what are the most likely questions that are going to come up in the examination and how you should approach answering those questions and memorizing your code and being ready to win at this exam. So the first thing to think about is that you need to break your code into sections. So don't memorize the whole code by itself. That's really complicated. You should try to separate out the individual parts into task one, task two, and task three. Like which exact bits of code make task two work. You always get the question, it says you can assume that task one has been completed for you. You can assume that task two has been completed for you. So you don't need to address like a whole programming loop that you've implemented or all of the input sections again that are used in a task one to answer a task three. You're just pulling out the small bit of code that makes that work. So knowing your tasks individually is going to really help you to answer the questions. Second, you should be confident in making small changes in your code that they might ask me to make. So what if, for example, we wanted to have 20 multiplication tables instead of 12? What if we wanted to be asking 10 questions instead of five questions? It's small changes that you could do within the code yourself. Now, the next thing is when you're getting your questions, you're going to have ones that ask you to make a programming solution and that will be a sort of pseudocode flowchart response you're also going to get ones that ask you to explain you cannot answer an explain question by just putting a memorized version of your code in you have to explain what the programming is actually doing so i used a conditional statement because i need to make a comparison between you know, really bringing out the programming language. We needed a for loop here for a set amount of iterations. I knew that there would be 10 iterations, five iterations, so I used a for loop because it allows a set number. I used a while loop because the condition needs to run until it is met and there is no definite end to this loop or this is a validation loop. So I used a while loop because I know that it may be a condition that never runs if a valid input is given the first time. So it's really getting into explaining the code rather than just putting, you know, while x equals true. So there's a common question format for the pre-release scenario. Now I'm not saying that this is 100% what you're going to get, but proven over the years, this is the most likely question order and type of question that you're going to get. So question one is pretty much always about declaring your data structures. So it's setting out the variables, the arrays, the constants. Then they're going to ask you to identify the data types that are used for each of those. So you should be able to explain the purpose of each variable and provide any ver validation that is used with it as well. So it's this data type. So it's an integer data type. And I've applied a range validation to ensure that the input is not less than zero and is less than 13. They may also ask you to make some small amendments to the code or do a small explanation of the code as it's working. Question two, they're going to ask you to write a programming solution to task two. So most likely this will be task two and it will just be either a complete flowchart or the complete pseudocode of the structured answer that you have created. So everything needed for task two in the programming construct. Now be careful when you complete these, you can use programming statements, that's absolutely fine. But bear in mind who your examiner is. Do they know the Java that you're using? Will they know the Python that you're using? Will they be okay if you've used a lot of library routines, um, especially if they want you to sort of iterate through rather than using set library functions? So I would just be careful about that and try to put it as close to pseudocode as you can. And if you can't remember exactly the pseudocode, put in the actual programming code. Question three, that's when you're going to get the explain question. So they're going to want you to explain what you did in task three. So this is full sentences. As we mentioned before, you're going to explain with technical verbiage or technical vocabulary exactly what it is that you did to solve this problem. And you can support that 
by using pseudocode. So before we mentioned, I used a validation. The validation may not have to run if a correct input is given. So I've used a while loop. Then you could put a little example of that while loop and put just a small bit of code that shows while this was the condition and then this is the error message and then end while. And then you continue to explain. So it's making a balance between explaining in full sentences and then just putting a bit of code in for reference. Okay, so looking at this question one, let's talk about suitable declarations. When you're setting up question one, they're going to ask you to give the variables, constants, and arrays that are used, and they will need to have meaningful names. So they should describe exactly what the data is that is stored inside. Here's some examples. If you had, for example, the correct count, so you wanted to count how many times a correct answer occurred, could be correct count. You want to have a student name input, so student underscore name. You need to have a constant that's storing a tax value, const tax. Calling it something like just T for tax or CC, correct count, something like that, or just STU, stu, that's not a descriptive or meaningful file name, so just don't worry if it makes it a little bit long. We're passing an exam. Put in a meaningful file name. So when it comes to variables, here are some rules for writing your variables. Variables always start with a lowercase letter at the beginning, and they're going to use either camel casing or snake casing. If you don't know what that means, you've probably seen it and just maybe not heard that wording. So camel casing is when the first letter is lower and then every word starts with a capital letter. So we can see it starts with a lowercase because it's a variable, meaningful, and then when you come to the next word it's going to be a capital letter for name. We also have snake casing which is when we use underscores in between the words, so meaningful underscore name. That's my preference. Either is fine as long as it is readable so that you can see the meaningful file name. Next is constants. So constants pretty much follow the um, same ability of camel casing or snake casing, but they're going to be saying const at the start. So you use the term const and then that will identify this is going to be a constant. Then you can capitalize the name of the, the data store. So whatever the meaningful name is, that would be capitalized. So take a look at this one. So we've got the camel casing, so it's going to say const and then tax in capitals, const underscore tax in capitals. When it comes to arrays, um, there are two different ways you can declare your array. You can either give it a specified or unspecified length. So you can create a blank array or you can outline that it's going to have 10 index positions within it. Always use the square brackets. That's how we identify that it's an array. It would use the square brackets when you declare it. Um, so take a look at this here. So for example, the type of car to be used, car underscore type equals, and then if it's a blank square brackets, that means that no length is given and you're gonna populate it throughout. That's fine to do. That's absolutely fine because any loop that you do later that populates it will evidence your ability to create the array to the correct size. Or you can declare it in advance and indicate how how many index positions there will be. Remember that arrays start at index position zero. You could also put one to ten, it's been accepted before, but personally I'll start at zero because that really evidences that you understand that arrays begin at zero. So next is about knowing your data types. They will ask you for data types and you may also need to then explain validation with that. When you're doing your data types, there's five main ones that we're going to want to consider and you should understand what each of those mean in the exam in the section two. You may well have to identify based on a sentence that explains what the data is to be stored, what that data type should be assigned. So it's good to know each of these. So we've got string data for text, integer for whole numbers, float for decimals, boolean for true, false, yes, no, on, off, anything with sort of two possible responses and then a character for a single character. Okay, validation rules. This is important. You will have a validation in your code and you need to be able to explain it and why you've used it. And that should be related back to data type as well. So the important thing to do is to memorize any validation that you used on the data that was input. So any input data that needed a validation, learn that 
rule. Know that rule as a piece of code that you can write out either pseudocode or in a programming statement. Then you should also be able to identify what type of check that was. So there are different types of validation checks and I'll list all of them in a moment. But for example, it could be a range check to identify that the numbers input are within the correct name. It could be a type to make sure that you're getting numeric data, presence to make sure that there is actually something in there. So learn those categories and we'll list them now. Pause it if you need to write them down. So there are six different types that I'm going to mention here. So the range would be any data that is within an accepted range. So it's within the bounds. The type would be to do a data type. Presence, it's not blank. There's data inside of it. Length, that's to do with character length, something you might use for passwords. Create a password with eight characters. That would be a length check. Character identifies if an invalid character is used. So for example, if you couldn't have symbols and you're only allowed to have text, character would be identifying that type of error. And format, so this is something we might use for like an identification, a postcode, something like that, where it needs to meet a specific format. So here, for example, this user ID has to be a letter, a letter, a number, a number, a number. Test data. So if you have used validation, you better know what test data you can use to test that the validation has worked. And I've given us an example here. So there's an age input. Um, it's an integer value and it needs to be greater than 15. And here are the three different types. So there's three different types, normal, abnormal, and extreme. Small definition of what that means. And then example of the test data. They don't want a piece of test data. They're looking for a set of data, a data set. So that means more than one value. I would personally try to get at least five. Here in normal data, anything greater than 15 would be accepted. So I've just done a list of all accepted values, numeric above 15. When we look at the abnormal, I always think it's better to try and demonstrate and sort of flex your understanding of exactly what you know as abnormal data. So not just something that is out of the bounds, like having 12, which is below, but also having it written in characters instead of being numbers. You Using a decimal when it's supposed to be a integer value, using incorrect symbols and text. The last one is the extreme data. So that's anything on the boundary. So the boundary of this, because it should be greater than 15, the accepted value here is 16. So 16 is the first accepted value. 15 is the boundary of not accepted. So you would want to test both of those values on the bounds, on the limits. When it comes to answering an exam, Personally, I would stick with normal and abnormal because it's the easiest to give a really big range of different data. Okay, so also the next thing is to know your if statements. So you should know it in pseudocode. They do accept programming statements in the task two question, task three question, but down the line in the second section of this exam, you may well have to write using specifically pseudocode, which means you need to know what that programming construct looks like. We have the simple if, then, else, and if. So this is two possible responses. If the condition is true, else it must be this, and if. Make sure you indicate that and if. They will be looking for it. Now, this is the next one is really important because this is more of a nesting of if statements. And so we have if then, that's our usual condition. What if we then need a second condition? This is called else if. If you're programming in Python, which the majority of people do, then you will have used elif. Well, in pseudocode, it's else if. So just be careful not to drop in that elif condition when you should have been on an else if. Then our third one after that is the case of statement. So that's set of, in the case of this condition, there will be possible responses in that case. So in the case of A, in the case of B, in the case of C, this is what the response would be. Otherwise, if it's none of these conditions, this will be the response. And so the last thing that we need to do is to learn our loops. There are three different types of loops that you should know. The while, do, end while, the for, to, and next, and the repeat until. With the while loop, the indication the loop has finished is end while. For a for loop, it's saying it's the next iteration will begin 
and in the repeat until, it will be until this condition is met. When we know we're waiting for a specific condition, we use the repeat until. When we have a set number of iterations, we use for to next. And when we have a loop that we don't know if it will ever run, it may never run, it just depends on a condition that could occur, then we use the while. You should know how to write all three of these in pseudocode and also be able to explain why you would choose that loop over another loop. So that was a really quick run through of some of the key information, possible questions that you might get in this examination. Really good luck to you. And thank you for watching Calciad. If you like this video, then of course, subscribe so you can keep up to date with the new content.